Hello, this is Dr. Chetna. Hope you all are doing fine. I'm from Mysore, obstetrician and gynecologist, uh, director of Matrushaya Hospitals. Thank you, Medversity, uh, for giving me opportunity today to speak about recurrent pregnancy loss. So let's begin now. Uh, it's mainly about recurrent pregnancy loss. What is, uh, so what, let's see what we are going to discuss today. The incidences and causes of RPL, diagnosis, treatment, and uh, choosing right progesterone for treating RPM. Next. So let's go into details about pregnancy, uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. See, what is uh, miscarriage? Miscarriage is a spontaneous loss of pregnancy before 20 weeks of gestation without any medical or mechanical means to terminate the pregnancy. So this is called as miscarriage. So recurrent, uh, what is recurrent pregnancy loss? According to UK guidelines, uh, the miscarriage happening more than three consecutive times is called as RPL. According to USA guidelines, it is more than two consecutive times. And according to the WHO guidelines, it is loss of fetus weighing less than 500 grams at 20 to 22 weeks of gestation. So in mainly it may be due, due to different causes like abnormality that is APLA syndrome, SLE or any congenital abnormalities or thrombophilias. We'll go into that details later on. Next. So types of RPL. There are uh, three types of RPL, which is primary RPL indicates two or more pregnancy losses who has not had a pregnancy beyond the age of viability. Secondary RPL indicates multiple pregnancy loss in women who has pregnancy beyond the age of viability. Uh, and tertiary RPL indicates many pregnancy losses before and after the normal pregnancies. So what is that viability? It is crossing 28 weeks of gestation or a live birth. Next. So incidence of recurrent pregnancy miscarriages. 10 to 15% of pregnancies result in spontaneous miscarriages. In RPL, recurrent miscarriage affects 0.5 to 2% of the total pregnant women. So risk, uh, risk of miscarriages, 30% of after two losses and 33% after two, uh, two losses does suggest a role, of, a role for evaluation after two losses. After two lo if, if a woman undergo recurrent pregnancy losses of more than two times, then we have to do um, advanced uh, uh, investigations to rule out the, uh, the cause for RPL. Let's go into the causes of RPL. So as I said, uh, so actually in RPL, 40 to 50% are unexplained. So uh, if even though we run all the investigation, there doesn't have any, they'll not, it will not show any problem in the investigations, but still they'll have recurrent pregnancy losses. This is called as unexplained uh, pregnancy loss. And even thrombophilias may account for 40 to 50%. So 10 to 15 percent is anatomical factors. That is any defect in the uterine uh, cavity itself, like septate, uh, biconiate, uniconiate uterus. 20 percent autoimmune diseases like A plus syndrome, SLE, and 0.5 to 5 percent of infections like torch infections when in childhood they've undergone any they've uh, got any infections like torch. Uh, and 70 to 20 percent is endocrine factors like thyroid abnormalities, hyperprolactinemia, and 2 to 5 percent genetic causes. Next. So, etiologies, let's go into the etiology and evaluate detailed evaluation. Uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, up to 60 percent of sporadic early miscarriages are mainly due to chromosomal abnormalities, that is, aneuploidies. Genetic abnormalities leading to miscarriage include chromosomal aberrations and gene mutations. In some people, they'll, be, uh, they'll have genetic mutations. Uh, these causes recurrent RPL. Balanced translocations found, is found in 3 to 5% of RPL compared to 0.7% of general population in these people who have recurrent pregnancy loss. And structural uterine defects. 19% with RPL, it includes congenital and acquired uh, and our, uh, CUA are found in 8 to 12 percent of women with RPL compared to 1 to 1.5 percent in general population. Septate uterus is the most commonest abnormality we usually see in this anatomical defects of uterus. Other anom anomalies, as I said, like uniconiate, biconiate, and uterine didelphus are associated with late pregnancy losses and preterm birth mainly. 
mainly in septuagesis itself we see pregnant pregnancy loss like, like uh, pre- miscarriage before 20 weeks in other defects it usually causes preterm uh, preterm uh, delivery so it all uh, so the anti phospholipid antibodies are acquired and it damages tropoblast this is one of the cause for rpl again and endocrine and metabolic or metabolic factors that is diabetes and thyroid abnormalities have been associated with rpl pcos is also associated with increased risk of miscarriage and luteal phase deficiency in, in which there is progesterone deficiency is also one of the cause of rpl other speculative causes are infectious agents as i said torch infections uh, so this has to be screened in these people suffering from recurrent pregnancy losses and endometritis and Endom- what is endometritis it is the infection of the endometrium it is reported in 58% of the rpl presence of plasma cells in endometrial sample confirms the presence of endometritis so we we should do endometrial biopsy in these patients to rule out endometritis next so screening for bacterial vaginitis uh, so uh, bacterial infection in the vagina is is also indicated in women with previous history of second trimester abortion or preterm labor ureoplasma ureolyticum mycoplasma hominis chlamydia listeria monocytogenes these are some of the organisms which are frequently found in the vagina and cervical cultures with sporadic abortions however there are no convincing data for the inf- uh, that the infections are one of the main causes of rpl and as i said inherited thrombophilias like factor v leiden mutation prothrombin gene mutation activated protein c resistance methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, reductase mutation all these are the co- uh, causes of thrombophilia which in turn leads to rpl so next coming to male factors so it's not only female who is responsible for recurrent abortions even the male factors comes into place uh, in these patients who are suffering from rpl that is they'll have uh, the sperm dna damage and rpls so the dna will uh, we should uh, diag- we should investigate even the sperms for dna fragmentation so dna fragmentation will be more in these people uh, whose wife is suffering from rpls and psychological lifestyle and environmental uh, conditions also uh, will add on to this uh, conditions and occupational issues like obesity alcohol caffeine cocaine and smoking and other addictive habits and alleomium factors and and last uh, but not the least which actually uh, is like 40 to 50% of rpl is due to unexplained rpl next so this uh, we'll go into the diagnosis and evaluation detailly so genetic we have to do karyotyping for the couple for both of them Uh, anatomical we have to do hysteroscopy we should advise patients if more than two abortions we always advise patients to come for hysteroscopy which we uh, pass a probe uh, a camera inside the cervix and we see we will evaluate the cervix and if if there is any uh, septate uterus or any polyp as such we will do therapeutic uh, uh, procedure also we will uh, ablate and we will just uh, cut the septa and remove the polyp or any other uh, uh, anatomical defect that that is called as hysteroscopy so hysteroscopy is, is always be- better to do when there is uh, twice uh, miscarriage is happening consecutively and endocrinal investigations like thyroid prolactin uh, all all these hormones we have to evaluate uh and possible testing for insulin resistance insulin resistance also we have to see uh, look at about mainly because in pcos they they'll have more uh, more insulin resistance and pre serum prolactin level and uh, ovarian reserve testing that is amh and anti thyroid antibodies these are the investigations that should be done for these people and infectious etiology uh so infectious etiology is also better to do uh, but this is last first we have to rule out the other causes and then come to the infectious etiologies uh if any cro- evidence of chronic endometritis like pid any white discharge continuously uh, we have to ask for the history first and if if any symptoms are there then we have to go and uh, do an endometrial biopsy and send it for culture and autoimmune diseases like apla anti cardiolipin antibodies igg igm lupus anticoagulant all these uh, hormones should be tested 
and uh, and we also should test for thrombophilia so homocysteine factor v led in pro thrombin promoter mutation activated pro protein c resistance so all these investigations should be evaluated in recurrency pre uh, recurrent pregnancy loss patients these are all uh, these investigations are highly expensive so we should uh, convince the patient uh, that each one has its own role and we should evaluate them thoroughly so that we can uh, uh, prevent the uh, abortion uh, happening next time i mean medical termination have i mean termination of pregnancy happening the next time so it's always important to do each of these investigations before planning for the next pregnancy next so uh, next uh, balance uh, therapeutic interventions so balanced translocations that is in gen genetic counseling ivf with pre implantation genetic diagnosis this is in these patients we can always advise to go if they are uh, affordable we always can advise them for ivf in vitro fertilization in which we have the chance to uh, genetically do a biopsy of the embryo and see if the bio, if the embryo is good for transplantation this is called as pre implantation genetic diagnosis or else they can go for a donor gametes also and at i'm coming to anatomical thing as i said histoscopy we we do both diagnostic and therapeutic if any mullerian anomalies or ashen ashenman syndrome is adhesions it may be co uh, caused due to chronic uh, pelvic inflammatory disease or due to tb any pelvic uh, tuberculosis uh, or any previous abortions uh, when extensive dnc is done these are the causes of ashenman syndrome uh, so histoscopically we can ashenman syndrome is like adhesions inside the cavity so we can remove the adhesions or if any submucosal fibroids are there we can remove any septic adhesions or polyp are there we can remove by histoscopy subserosal uh, myomectomy for those intramural and subserosal fibroid only can be done if it is more than 5 cm otherwise only submucosal fibroids are important to remove submucosal fibroid is fibroid projecting inside the cavity so we have to remove even though if it is small uh, submucosal fibers are always better to remove because they are one of the hindrances for the implantation of the pregnancy uh, happening of the embryo so it's always better to remove the submucosal fiber so coming to endocrine a uh, pcod can be uh, treated by uh, medical line of treatment like metformin and myoinositol uh metformin to reduce the insulin resistance and uh, myoinositol or we can put on uh, oral contraceptive pills for 3 months and re regularize their hormone imbalance and uh the periods we can regularize the periods hypothyroidism we can treat by uh thyroxine or eltroxine and retinal phase defects we can give pro high progesterone supplementation in case of diabetes mellitus appropriate ma management of diabetes we can do or uh, we can uh, give insulin in mm, resistant cases so in case of infection we can put on higher antibiotics to suppress the endometritis in autoimmune condition condition uh, what we can do is that in when uh, the patient is like tested positive for pregnancy from the beginning itself we can start on aspirin and low molecular weight heparin in women uh, we can continue till 32 weeks and then we can taper and mainly in patients who are suffering from sle apla and other autoimmune diseases and or uh, any uh, or any history of uh, thrombosis uh, and in thrombophilias in thrombophilias and environmental exposures uh, we can give therapeutic anticoagulants and isolated defect and no personal or strong family history of thrombotic complications prophylactic and anticoagulation we can always keep hyperhomocysteinemia we can always supplement folic acid continuously like 0.4 to 1 mg per day and vitamin b66 mg per day and possibly vitamin b12 also 0.0025 uh, mg per day continuously throughout the pregnancy and consider prophylactic anticoagulation in hyper uh, homocysteinemia uh, and refractory to dietary interventions and we have to limit exposure to these addictive uh, to, uh, addictive dra drugs alcohol caffeine and tobacco So these are the therapeutic interventions. Uh, what we should do in unnext board is unnext.